Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so this is probably going to be the simplest uh, presentation that Sialuk has seen. <laughs> Uh, my name is Hakan Duran. I am uh, at Iowa City and been a proud member of this group, uh, I don't know, for two years maybe now, maybe longer actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't come from like a technical background. So, uh, you know, please forgive my uh, silly statements and, uh, you know, uh, like simple mistakes that, uh, or confusions that uh, I may have during the presentation or discussions or, you know, things like that. So I'm just pretending like I know what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, appreciate your um, uh, understanding, you know. So, uh, 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 you know, I, I am uh, kind of like sensitive about like privacy issues, uh, not because I have something to hide or anything like that, but I just don't like people you know, uh, kind of uh, uh, using me as a uh, kind of like a like a marketing tool, I guess. You know, uh, and um, uh, that that is um, what kind of like uh, triggered probably this uh, project for me. So, um, uh, you know, as you know, Google and uh, Apple uh, kind of like have a big hold on the. Uh, uh, you know, like the cell phone industry and everything like that. And uh, I don't think it would be exaggerating to say that, you know, they kind of like uh, track the data, the location data, you know, like the the websites visited, etc. all that. And uh, unfortunately, these are not only companies, I don't think, uh, Verizon, all the uh, cell phone ISPs, etc. probably are doing the same thing. Uh, and I, I do understand that there is probably no way out of this, to be honest with you. I mean, no matter what you do, uh, you will uh, end up getting tracked and followed and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, but I guess my uh, sentiment is uh, I can I can do something uh, and maybe make the, their life a little bit harder uh, to, uh, to totally... Uh, follow me like without uh, like the whole freedom that they have I guess you know like this is not a great philosophy I don't think but I mean you know it is also like a little bit of a, a challenge etc so let me just cut to the chase I'm sorry if I'm rambling too much here uh, so uh, uh, I, I've been hearing people uh, kind of like flushing their cell phones, uh, flushing their boots, getting like the root access, etc. All that. I never had the guts to do that, uh, to be honest with you, because I mean, cell phones are expensive. You don't want to mess with that. Your life depends on it, really. Your professional life and your personal life, everything, really. You know, you need them all the time. So uh, uh, lately, this idea came up to me that I can perhaps buy a, like a cheap cell phone from eBay and then experiment on it, like uh, experimenting on a Pi uh, computer or, you know, Raspberry Pi or something like that. So uh, that, that, is, that is how I did it. I, I bought this uh, Pixel 4a, uh, you know, this is the phone here uh, on eBay, essentially. It, I think it costs 100 bucks. I mean, I, I'm not going to claim that it is cheap, but it is cheaper than some other, uh, you know, like uh, options. Uh, and then, uh, uh, because it's not my main machine, uh, I had the courage to uh, kind of like um, uh, do experiment on it. Uh, and there, there are a few options out there. And I kind of like chose Graphene OS uh, because it was Android based. It was like a fork of Android, actually. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a kind of like de-googled your phone, your Android system. And this is the website here. and. I'm just going to kind of like go through the website here. Uh, and installation process is amazingly simple. You know, it is, I was very impressed with how easy that was, honestly. Uh, and it's all web-based, really. You don't need to uh, install uh, any, like a serial driver or, I don't know, anything that would uh, facilitate communication between your computer and your uh, cell phone other than plugging a USB uh, with the USB-C going to the cell phone, 
uh, and uh, going to this web page really, and then just follow the instructions verbatim. And uh, I was able to do this uh, like at the first attempt really, and that would tell you something, you know, uh, in terms of how easy that was. So uh, there's like a good uh, history here in terms of like what this project is about. Uh, you know, if you go to the features page, you know, uh, there's a like lots of like detailed explanation here, uh, but I've been using this for uh, probably a little bit more than a month. So it does give you like a very fine, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say very fine, but fine uh, uh, detail of control on every one of your apps. So you can, uh, uh, you know, limit the uh, uh, permissions uh, for any app to use your sensors, location data, like the camera, uh, microphone, uh, you know, things like that, more so than a regular Android uh, OS would do. Uh, you may uh, define certain folders that the apps can see and uh, others that they cannot reach uh, or read or write permissions, etc. all that. Uh, kind of like like a Linux uh, kind of like an operating system in terms of permission like the ACLs and you know however you call it uh, not as uh, as much control as Linux of course uh, but a lot better than the like the um, uh, what you might call it the uh, regular Android OS uh, you know I suppose so I, I kind of like it uh, you can give permission just for once. Uh, you can pretend that you gave permission. Uh, so the app believes that it has the permission, uh, but it actually doesn't. It can only go to like one folder. For example, for SyncThink, which is uh, what I love to use on my, like the camera uh, folder, uh, you can uh, uh, install SyncThink and give access to only like this certain folder, like the camera folder that it, it has access to and it, it cannot access anything else. Similar uh, situations for Nextcloud, other things, you know, like it is a, uh, I think this is what usually like nerds like, right? Like finer control on the software that they use on a day-to-day -day basis. So that was the big hit for me that the, like the, in terms of like uh, liking this. Uh, for you technical guys, uh, I am sure there is a lot of uh, like uh, interesting points here in terms of security and everything like that. Uh, the Google Play the Store, if you choose to install that, is sandboxed, for example. It thinks that it has total control on the OS, but it actually doesn't. So, uh, you know, I, I think I like it. Like it, uh, Google uh, Play Store asks me every day whether I want to kind of like update the app and I simply decline it. I don't know if this can be uh, permanently disabled. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I didn't look into that honestly, but I don't mind uh, pushing, you know, decline uh, every day when I have the question. Uh, but uh, it's just another confirmation to me that the Google doesn't have full rights on my phone, I suppose. I don't know. It's just a little silly uh, kind of like a, gratification, you know, call it that way. Uh, storage scopes is what I was referring to, like having access to certain folders and uh, having the apps believe that they have access to every folder that they, they would like to have, uh, although they don't, you know. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot here in terms of, uh, you know, um, about like security features, etc. Uh, it is encrypted uh, from the get-go. Uh, I have an app uh, like from, from my workplace that wouldn't allow me to um, uh, like have email access unless my cell phone is encrypted. Uh, and that app actually checks the encryption, whether it is enabled or not. Uh, so I was able to install that app uh, on, on this operating system. So I know that this encryption is real, uh, you know, uh, other than just trusting the Graphene OS people that it is encrypted, you know. Uh, Vanadium is the uh, uh, their version of Chromium. They come up with this name. Uh, and uh, it is uh, just like Chromium. It is very easy to use, very user-friendly. 
uh, I have every reason to believe that it is not kind of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping track of uh, what I'm doing and, you know, having access to things that I don't want it to have access, etc. all that. And, uh, you know, certain websites don't work with it. That, that is how I know it is not perfect like Chromium, but it is good enough. Trust me, I, 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 I didn't have any problem uh, in like what I use actually from day to day um, stuff. They have some uh, apps bundled with the OS, such as the camera, the PDF viewer, the messaging app, like the text messaging. Uh, there's an auditor app, so to speak, and I, I couldn't get like wrap my head around what it does. Uh, it's an attestation service that uh, has provides strong hardware-based verification of the authenticity and integrity of the firmware software on the device. Uh, in order to use this, you need a second Android phone uh, to be able to confirm this. Uh, and I don't have a second Android phone that I can use at the same time, so I didn't do this. I transferred the SIM card from my Samsung phone to this one. And I didn't test if I could do this authentication auditor app without the SIM card being installed on the Samsung. Maybe it does work, but I just wasn't that interested, I suppose, you know, so that is my uh, defense. Uh, there's a nice location data access indicator that lights up every time an app uses location services. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, you know, it's just a feedback, I guess, because you give permission to the app to use location uh, and it just confirms that it is using the location, I guess, that's the way I understand it. And um, yeah, I mean, that is that is uh, kind of like the Graphene OS in a nutshell. Uh, like the device support, you can see on this page that uh, Pixel phones essentially are the only phones that are supported by this OS. Uh, and Pixel 4a support is ending in August. Uh, so uh, it, it was my just toy really, but I love the quality of the phone. I like the like the smaller size of it. Really, my Samsung was S9, and it was like a lot larger than this. This is like the original iPhone size, really. And I, I realized that I missed this size, really. Even though I'm an old guy and I need like reading glasses and everything, uh, it is uh, it, it is lighter. It is better. I don't know if I want to really upgrade to Pixel Seven or Pro because they are larger phones, really. Uh, I, I may have to, I don't know, but uh, you know, this kind of like a, uh, going backwards, actually, I liked it a little bit. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it, it felt uh, very user-friendly and uh, portability-wise and everything like that. I, I liked it very much. So uh, if we go to that installation page that, um, uh, they are talking about here, like let's click this thing here and hopefully it should get us there if um, the internet gods allow us. Yeah, here we go. So uh, two officially supported installation methods. One of them is the web USB based installer. The other one is the command line installation guide uh, for this. Uh, you gotta uh, kind of like use the command line, obviously. Uh, I did use the web USB based installer. And for this one, uh, you need to use, uh, I believe Chromium. Firefox would not work for this. Uh, so let's see, prerequisites. You need to have like one of these uh, operating systems. I did it on Arch Linux. Again, it worked the first time, really, like very straightforward, uh, you know, no hard attacks or anything like that. Uh, I did use Chromium, uh, you know, um, uh, on Arch Linux uh, to be able to do this. Uh, and, you know, this web page walks you through this. You need to first enable the OEM uh, unlocking, uh, and you go to the settings on the Android phone and uh, push the about phone button repeatedly until uh, the phone reports you after the fifth or sixth tab that developer mode is enabled, right? 
uh, after that, uh, you kind of like, I, I, I forgot what it exact, exactly was, uh, but you um, um, go to the, um, you know, uh, back to uh, um, your computer, uh, connect the uh, phone to the uh, computer when the web page is up, essentially. Uh, and you need to, the, here we go. You need to boot your phone into the bootloader interface. To do this, you need to hold the volume down button while the phone boots, phone boots. Uh, and then uh, the phone screen will look like a command line interface at that point. Uh, and then you connect the, uh, uh, um, uh, essentially, phone to your uh, computer from the like the USB cable. And uh, you see this unlock bootloader uh, button here, which is disabled uh, when the cursor is on. Uh, but when you are at that stage with a phone connected to the this web page and your laptop uh, by the USB cable, this becomes enabled, right? On a Chromium browser. And then you kind of like click this button and magically the bootloader becomes unlocked. Then uh, the next button becomes enabled after that. So, I mean, to cut the long story short, you kind of like walk through this web page, clicking one button at a time, essentially. The phone reboots, uh, installs software, the Android uh, little icon starts turning the wheels, etc. all that. And then uh, at the end, you lock your bootloader again. Uh, to maintain the encryption and the safety, security features, etc., and you're done essentially. Uh, like it is, it is very straightforward. Really, you don't need root access or anything like that. It does take care of everything for you. And for uh, more advanced versions like Pixel six, seven, there are verification methods that uh, you know you are installing the uh, like the right package, etc. All that. There wasn't one for Pixel 4a, so I just took the like the leap of faith uh, and did that. And you know, I I, I mean, it, it it just it just did work. I mean, again, I'm not claiming that this is the most sane thing to do, or uh, it's like a brilliant thing to do, or anything like that. But uh, it was uh, surprisingly smooth, I would say. And uh, you can, after finishing all this. Uh, you can actually go back to the stock OS, stock uh, Android, you know, uh, um, just again from the web UI uh, and flash the, uh, like the whatever chip in the phone uh, with the stock Android version if you are sick and tired of this and want to go back. So uh, I, I, I kinda, kind of like switch to my phone, like share the screen of my phone, and maybe you can actually see like how it looks on the phone itself uh, uh, to be able to have a, like an idea. Uh, like let's share the screen, start now. Now this is the, this is the, this is my, I guess, home page. You can see my calendar, uh, you know, like the widgets up there and the, 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 the packages, uh, you know, in like groups, as you see, WhatsApp, you know, Slack, Slack is there. Um, uh, you know, uh, maybe I can use my cursor here, like Plex, Twitch, you know, like the, uh, whatever you call this, the social um, Mastodon app and all that. And the next page, you know, is the, this weather widgets and the search bar, uh, this uses, um, I think this uses, I don't know if it uses like Brave or Brave Search, I think that is what it uses, but you can define that uh, yourself. Now uh, on the bottom, you see the like the phone button. The, these are like quick access. This is the calendar app. This is the settings. So this is what I'm gonna tap next, but I don't know if you'll be able to see the screen. Here you go, you can see the screen. So. Yes, yeah, this is uh, um, uh, like the regular Android settings kind of like screen here, I guess, you know, uh, if you, for example, tap the, the thing, uh, you know, you have the VPN, 
you have all these settings that you can actually, uh, you know, like change. Uh, you know, the apps, uh, you know, like nicely list the recently opened apps. So maybe if I can click the calendar, it kind of like gives you the permissions, like what permissions it has. I'm gonna tap this one and I can just, you know, if I, uh, you know, tap something here, like for example, it doesn't have access to music and audio, I can give access to that or I can withdraw that essentially. I can uh, pause activity if I'm used or choose to uh, give it an exception to not do that, you know. Uh, and some of these may be in the stock Android, probably they are, uh, but I feel like, you know, some of these settings are not there, you know, like let's go to, like for example, the, the sync thing, like I, you can see the bit word in there. Um, oh, here's, the, here's one good example. Gboard is the Google's keyboard, right? So uh, why the heck would you use Google keyboard if you are so hot in privacy? Uh, because there's the possibility of Google watching every of one of your keystrokes, right? I mean, I totally agree with that. However, see, I don't give it permission to use uh, like, uh, you know, uh, anything other than sensors, really. Sensor is the, like the touch screen. So it cannot use my microphone. So it cannot do uh, voice to text conversions, but you can enable that if you want. It definitely doesn't have access to network, you know? So it cannot, even if it tracks me, it has to wait for network connection, I guess, which is still doable, I, I agree, but I'm not that paranoid, I suppose, I don't know. I mean, I like this uh, fine grain control, I guess, uh, for whatever it is worth. And it may just be fooling myself, uh, but again, you know, uh, I, it's just an experiment for me. and. Uh, you know, uh, nothing more than that, really. Uh, for the sync thing, I use this uh, sync thing fork here. So for the permissions, uh, I think it is the storage scopes. Yeah, here's the storage stops, scopes. So it has access to camera folder, as you see here. And there is this uh, sync folder that uh, I have some like family pictures that I wanted to be present on my phone, but also on my uh, SyncThink server uh, permanently. So I, I use it as a, like a photo gallery folder that always syncs uh, with the server, etc. all that. So, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is the application permissions. Uh, other than that, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, very, very, very user friendly, very uh, practical. I, I, I liked it very much, you know. Um, and if you go to that page, you can see all the applications. You know, I think this is the apps uh, that come with the, uh, the thing. I did install the Google Play. You don't have to install apps from Google Play. You can use F-Droid, for example or there's another Aurora store or something like that, that uh, you can use install apps from that store. Uh, but if you choose to use Google Play services, it puts it in a sandbox and uh, it doesn't give uh, the, uh, the full blown permissions to this. So I, I trusted them and I'm using it for whatever it is worth. The PDF viewer comes with the OS, camera auditor, uh, this thing that we talked about earlier comes with the OS. Uh, calculator, clock, contacts, you know, um, files, uh, like a very nice uh, file manager. Uh, you know, uh, this is my, I think, uh, downloads folder here. Uh, if you go to the root, these are the folders. Uh, this is the sync folder that I uh, kind of like shared earlier. You can create folders, you can delete them. You know, it is, it is, I think very easy to use really. The gallery is the regular, like the photo gallery, your camera, your, you know, uh, other folders, etc. all that. And uh, I've been using with my like WireGuard uh, VPN, uh, which the server is on a VPS. Uh, so, 
you can tell from this icon here, it is enabled all the time and set to disallow any connections outside of VPN. It works great. I mean, you know, uh, I can obviously disable it. Sorry, let's see if I can uh, show you that. This is kind of like the, uh, I don't know what this is called, but the, the drop down things. Pixel 4a that you see here is the like the WireGuard wire connection. Um, you know, um, and uh, sorry, come on. And this is kind of like the silent notifications. I mean, syncing is running, conversations is running, Zoom meeting is progress, KDE connect, there's nothing to connect at this time. I don't know what manage shows. It goes back to settings, I suppose, notification settings. So that's that's it, really. I mean, uh, it's a nice, I think, uh, project to play with if you have time and if you have interest. Do you need it? I mean, need is a very elastic term, <laughs> you know. Uh, so uh, I mean, I'm doing it for curiosity more than anything else. And I'm very pleasantly surprised that I can use this like $100 phone with this OS as my daily driver. I was so, you know, um, happy to get this work uh, to this degree. So I, I'm not using my a lot more expensive Samsung phone anymore uh, and um, totally happy about it. So I, I just wanted to share and I was very excited about all this. Thank you for listening to me. So that, that's all I got. Thank I you. Hope it, a... I, I hope it wasn't disappointing, I'm, you know. Oh, no, it was amazing. And uh, you, you are far too modest. Uh, uh, I'll let you in on a little secret. We're all just faking it until we make it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know you're not, but you know, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. It was impressed that you got the phone on to Zoom that fast. Yeah, I, I'm amazed at how well it worked. I, I had a old Pixel 4 and uh, other than the fact the, the battery on it's totally trashed uh, and you'd have to have it plugged in almost all times. Uh, it's amazing how responsive that thing still is because it, it was there towards the end, a, a total dog. I mean, I think part of this, again, this is paranoia speaking, right? Uh, but part of the battery life perhaps is the amount of communication with the phone and the, the, the home, calling home feature in like many apps, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't know how old this phone is, honestly. I, I bought it from eBay. I have no idea the age of, about the age of the phone and stuff like that and the battery therefore, uh, but um, I can use it all day. Uh, I am, because it's an old phone, I'm trying to keep the battery between 40 and 80% charge uh, not try, trying to not go over 80% charge and not go below 40% charge to be able to give it the maximum lifespan. That's what I read somewhere, you know? And I can use this phone whole day, starting from 80% and probably ending up around like 35% by 5.36 PM. You know what I mean? And a part of that I am speculating is because maybe my phone is not calling home as much as other Android uh, OS does or something. I don't know. I mean, I, I, it is just a speculation and again, take it to the grain of salt, uh, but I am I am very happy. That's all I got to say, <laughs> you know, so. No, um, amazing presentation. Uh, I, I'm afraid mine won't uh, to hear finish out the, uh, the, the uh, talk here unless other people have questions for uh, you. I am curious about the KDE Connect. Do you use that? Does it work well? Uh, I well, I, I, I uh, it's a nice project. I use it mainly to transfer files from the PC okay. that it is connected. I don't, I mean, you can use it as a mouse. Like you can use your cell phone as a mouse on your computer screen. Uh, you can do other like shenanigans. I mean, uh, they are nice as a toy, but I don't use it uh, that way. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you, you definitely have my my interest. I remember seeing that and wondering, thanks for the reminder, uh, but 
yeah, I, I'm definitely interested in in that uh, as well here. Uh, may, maybe for a uh, another night's uh, demo here as a little lightning talk. Sure, absolutely. I it, that sounds like an amazing, especially like if you're giving a presentation or something. If you can use your uh, uh, oh, yeah. phone as a, a mouse, that that's just darn right cool. Absolutely, absolutely, and that is it is very easy to set up. You just need a Linux machine to connect, it, really, and yeah. open open some ports, which I forgot the numbers, like a couple of ports you need to open, uh, and obviously your phone needs to be connected to the same Wi-Fi and not using the VPN or something. You know what I mean? Uh, like the same IP range uh, with the yeah. Linux machine. I, actually, I think if uh, both your phone and your uh, uh, computer were on the, the same VPN uh, connection, they, then it still would be okay. Yes, correct, correct, that is correct. Uh, I've got a question. Sure. I, look, I looked at the project, it looks like it only runs on Pixel. Correct, that is correct. So why would I want to spend three or four or $500 for Pixel phone that I might turn into a brick when I can buy a brand new phone with equivalent power for half of that absolutely you don't have to you don't do that you don't have to i mean uh, I, I think pixel phones are uh, you know I, I, this is my first pixel phone so i'm not going to pretend like i know uh, their quality i did hear good things about them but uh, this is the first time i'm using one and this is a relatively aged one and i like the quality of this particular model but I cannot speak for the rest, honestly. And uh, as we all know, sometimes the quality degrades as a new version comes out. It is possible, you know what I mean? It's not always the newer generation will always be better than the older generation. So I'm not gonna claim that either. Uh, and because of the same concern, Lee, uh, that is why I didn't buy a brand new Pixel phone. I just wanted to use it as an experiment, really. Let's see how it's gonna fly. and. Yeah. That's why I bought a very cheap version of it and uh, nicely surprised, you know, but I agree with you. I would have a bigger heart attack or uh, uh, like heartache, I guess, if I do the same thing with a brand new Pixel 7a or something, you know what I mean? I, I, I no, no, what, I, what I'm saying, even, even use Pixel phones. I've never spent over 200 bucks for, for a new Android phone and five and 10 ever. And I've been buying Motorola for the last three versions, and there you get their top of the line top of the line phone for two hundred bucks. The cheapest Pixel I see on eBay is at least double that. Yeah, I, I it, it sounds like a neat project, but you know, unless you got Pixels laying around in your, <laughs> in your recycle bin, <laughs> the, the, the benefit is say I have a Pixel phone and it's uh, end of life, uh, no longer supported due to security updates or something like that because it's been what, yeah. four years or yeah. whatever it is, then, then this would be a amazing project to prolong its life. Uh, it looks like they actually are following Google's life cycle, which he mentioned. I, I think it's really like, like, like Harper mentioned, it's really more about the de-Googling of it than okay. anything else. Okay, that makes sense. I, from what I, from what I'm gathering, both watching, watching the demo, uh, which was beautiful, by the way, and what I'm seeing on the website, it seems like they're basically just looking at ALSP, de-googling it, and then recompiling, which is probably why they get the compatibility so well, um, as well as being able to, to do what they do and, and only saying that we're going to run on these phones. Uh, there are similar projects, though, if you wanted something like Lineage OS that run on a, a lighter. That, that's the one I was trying to remember, but I, I doubt it has quite as nice of a website install path. That, that has to be the easiest phone uh, install path I've ever seen. That website actually convinced me to try this. You know, like it can't be that simple, I thought, and I just wanted to test it, and, you know, it, it worked. So. I have no affiliations with this, you know, like project or company or anything like Pixels or anything like that. I just wanted to share my excitement with you. That's all. Have you have you tried Lineage OS or any other alternative Android distributions? 
I have not. I okay. have not. I just be kind of curious how they compare. I, I don't know. I mean, again, this is the first time I was bold enough to try anything close to this, really. Uh, and as you your form falls off of uh, support there, uh, it may be uh, worth playing in, in that lineage OS space where it, it would be then still supported. Yeah, I I have tried lineage OS and did not care for it. I did not really see the advantage and I saw several disadvantages. Really, um, what, what issues did you run into? Uh, just hardware compatibility, a little bit of crashing. Um, it didn't seem really as stable. It seemed a little bit more responsive, but not really as stable and like like camera, right? Sometimes the camera just, just wouldn't work. It'd be like, sorry, we can't open that. It's like, okay, thanks. Um, but after this, I think I'm gonna start poking around on eBay and maybe get an old pixel to try to try it out. <laughs> Yeah, the, the thing I really like the sound of in Graphene OS was sandboxing Google Play services, because that's that's kind of a deal breaker when like trying because I've tried to, you know, do some degoogling on, you know, vanilla Android. And like so many things depend on Google Play services and it's it's kind of hard to live without. So it's so sandboxing Agreed. that sounds great. Well, Agreed. Uh, and sorry. The, I mean the other uh, software installation services like Asteroid and I didn't look at the Aurora store. But I doubt that they will have that many apps available in those stores. You know, like, uh, I mean, I got to install s several apps for my work, like the duo security, you know, like things that, um, you know, et cetera. So I, I need Google Play and this worked for me. Yeah, yeah. I use F-Droid as well, but it has maybe like a, a third of, of the apps I want, so. I believe Amazon also has an Android store as well, which oh, of course a is a whole other level of evil. <laughs> and nothing works. <laughs> they are, uh, Amazon is uh, advertising this, uh, like the photo storage option now. Um, like bring all of your photos to Amazon. I think at some point they did the same for the music files and then they change something, I believe, in the end user agreement or something. I, I don't remember the details, but the, it, felt, the, it felt like a trap to me. Yeah, I don't know the the euros and all that, but I know that the, the big, like, you know, obviously not necessarily privacy focused thing, but the big selling point of Amazon photo storage is that if you have a Prime subscription, Part one of your perks, right? Because they, they always say it's a perk, right? You get your free prime shipping, which may or may not actually be two day. Uh, you get your videos and stuff that most of which are free. One of those additional perks is that the you get unlimited photo storage without uh, quality loss. You can actually upload raw files and it does not account, count against your storage quota. Uh, oh, wow. Not many know. services do that. Yeah, yeah which, which, Flickr had that for a while, and it was one of their selling points, and then they made it a paid option. And Amazon was like, look at us. We're still free. We're just probably tracking all your photos and making a copy for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, mean, I, 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 I do use uh, the Amazon Photo as a backup service, and I've chucked terabytes of raws at it, and it it's great. Yeah, and I and I've spot checked, right? Like I look JPEG, uh, RAW, and PNG. I think are the three that I tested. But I've spot checked, and when I pull them back down, they have the same checksums. So they truly are preserving the file integrity, at least within the time frame that you. Yeah, I think it was over a year. But yeah. Again, my uh, paranoid uh, nerves keep firing in those kind of like situations because I mean, why would they do that? Like, why why would they do that? You know, I mean, uh, what are they gaining from this? I mean, there's yeah. gotta be a gain, you know? Training data sets. That's yeah. right, yeah. face recognition. That is what it is, I think, you know? Which is, I mean, it's nice to have software projects, but it's also nice to be consented. Yeah, I was actually on my way in listening to an NPR uh, report about uh, apparently in uh, New York right now, 
uh, there's like Madison Square Gardens and a bunch of other uh, like theaters uh, now have facial recognition on entry and uh, they've straight up uh, blacklisted anyone who's a lawyer who's involved in a lawsuit against them. So as you walk in, you actually uh, get turned around and kicked out. I read that same story as well. Yeah, so that, that was a real interesting thing. Apparently uh, it, it's being tried in uh, court right now. But uh, so anyway, uh, anyone with any other questions here? Uh, real quick here, I can show off a, a cool little toy that I've been playing with while uh, in between uh, diaper changes here. Uh, let me hit share. And uh, here we go. Uh, so part two, if time allows, and th this is really a simple, easy, stupid uh, uh, little demo. But uh, yeah, uh, I think everyone here knows me. Uh, but a little brief intro on what I, I'm playing with here. Uh, uh, basically, I took a uh, uh, sort of hybrid uh, approach to running a Kubernetes cluster where I have the, uh, the master node running uh, down in my basement uh, under my desk. And then uh, it's connected to a tail scale network, which uh, we'll talk about here in a second. And then uh, one of the... Uh, 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 worker nodes is actually running up in the cloud somewhere. And I, I found like one of those real cheap, you, you pay like 15, 20 bucks a year and you get a, a VPS. So it's clearly not the best and the brightest, but uh, essentially all that I intend on running on it is just ingress. And uh, they're both running the latest version of Ubuntu LTS. So uh, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, of course, K3S is uh, uh, a uh, sort of the, the good parts of uh, Kubernetes, which is just a containerization orchestration system across multiple nodes. And the server itself is basically a self-contained, uh, all the stuff that you need to run uh, Kubernetes uh, as a master here. So you've got essentially the API server that everything all connects into, Flannel providing the network uh, backing, and then a bunch of other stuff that all kicks off uh, container uh, uh, D pods of your workers. And of course, the big trick is you don't really care where it's running because as long as it's running on the cluster, it's all good. And uh, the, the big thing that's different here is then that thing running out on the edge here is just running the agent. And uh, uh, the, the big trick here is this uh, in front of this proxy here is that VPN uh, service. So it appears as if it's all living on the same network, even though it's really not. And so TailScale is essentially a commercialized version of WireGuard that, uh, uh, here can I believe yours, uh, you're connecting to a VPS uh, so uh, instead of having that, that uh, interconnect between your nodes, uh, one of their nice things is instead of having to go through a uh, centralized server, uh, each one of your nodes will actually direct connect to itself. So example, my laptop here is connected to my WireGuard network. It has a direct connection to my home as well as that VPS. So I'm not having to go through my home adding latency to the, the, the process. And basically everyone all connects into a coordination server. And the best part is, even though parts of it are less than free, free as in uh, uh, software, it is for a certain number of nodes, I, I wanna say 20 nodes, uh, it's free as in beer. And so it's, I mean, in a perfect world, I'll end up setting up WireGuard but uh, I've been a little distracted here lately, so it was the easy button. And uh, as I was talking about, my head server is an Intel uh, i7, just a cheap uh, Woot special uh, with 16 gigs of RAM. And then on the edge, the ingress it has four cores which uh, and four gigs of RAM and then a public facing IP address. 
where uh, this is a 10 dot address sitting inside of my own home network. Is that actually the public ID? Yeah, okay. go for Fancy. it. So the ingress means like a public IP access point or something? I mean, do you know what I'm asking? Uh, yes. What does ingress so, mean? I guess. An ingress point is basically, so say I want to host a web server on uh, inside of my Kubernetes cluster. Well, it doesn't do me any good unless I expose it out to the world. So uh, th think of it as a way of uh, serving as a reverse proxy sitting in front of whatever you're hosting inside of Kubernetes. So I could have five or six different Nginx servers all serving out different things. And then if you go to myspecialsite.com, you, you get the, the right Nginx server, basically, if that makes sense. Uh, and ba basically, it uh, serves as both uh, uh, SSL uh, termination as well as uh, just routing uh, to get you to the right uh, container or set of containers. Because say I have a really popular website and I have five or six different uh, machines all running copies of this, it, it can also do that round robin uh, uh, load uh, distribution as well. So to get uh, TailScale installed, it's really easy. If you trust the internet, you can just copy and paste that curl command, and then it will prompt you uh, to sign in, and uh, you, you can uh, disable key exp expiration for like uh, these servers because I don't want to have to sign back in because that, hey, nobody's got time for that. And... Uh, so uh, once you install that, you, you can run the, the command line as well, but one, once it's installed, basically you end up with a IP address and everything looks great. I believe, yeah, here it is. Uh, so it, it ends up being that, uh, for example, my uh, edge server ends up having an internal address of uh, 194.22.122 where the uh, one under my uh, desk is 88. And uh, these are also a DNS addresses as well. And so if you uh, just ping Kate Master, you end up uh, actually getting my, my home computer here. <laughs> uh, so anyway, though, at that next point, to actually install uh, K3S, again, just trusting the internet, because who doesn't? Uh, the, the, this is the command I use to set up things on my, my actual uh, machine. And let's, let's slide this out of the way. So the, the big gotch is here. Uh, so I, I'm curling it and then piping it in to run the, the command via SH. And the, the big gotchas are that I have to expose what my, the tail scale addresses are and then advertise it also. Uh, because the, the big uh, gotcha here was by default, it was using my internal 10 dot IP address, which the moment you tried connecting to someone else out, not on my local network, uh, it just wouldn't work. And then everything failed and yeah, that several hours to figure out. But once it ends up running, then if you <laughs> uh, cat out this uh, node token, uh, basically, that ends up being the uh, secret that all of the uh, uh, slave nodes actually have to connect into and use uh, in order to join your cluster, which is why it's uh, been conveniently erased here, because otherwise Jared would be connecting into my Kubernetes cluster here. <laughs> And uh, the, the other gotcha is that you have to tell Flannel to use TailScale uh, to communicate between the, the two nodes. Otherwise, uh, you, you end up with it not necessarily using the, the right uh, network and then it not actually working. Uh, sorry, sorry for the silly question again. What is Flannel? Uh, so Flannel is actually the... Uh, the, the network uh, overlay that ends up making it look like for uh, K3S, 
so that if you have a image running on one of your machines, it can actually talk to an image running on another machine. And it, it makes that, that network uh, look like you're all together in one spot. So uh, internal to the, the cluster, it, it uh, manages the, the network connections, basically, if that makes sense. <laughs> But so anyway, inside of uh, uh, Tailscale, you have some real nice, here's all of the, the networks that are all the machines that are on your network. You, you can set up all sorts of ACLs and uh, far more configuration than any sane person would want to do unless you're a network spook uh, so that you could make sure that uh, user A can only talk to these machines, but user B can't talk. I mean, you, the, it's amazing the amount of stuff that you can do with that. I, I'm just a humble, stupid user at this point, but it's fairly easy. And uh, so then once I ran the, those two commands that we were talking about here on this edge node and joined it in, uh, if you take a look here, uh, we can actually take a look and see that I am uh, so the, the big gotchas here are I'm asking for pod, what pods. I have an engine, Nginx server running. And then if I ask for the nodes, you can see I've got the two machines up and connected, and they've been running for a few days now. And then I have the, the ingress uh, running as well here. And so uh, the, that was the, the big uh, demo or the, the big... Uh, uh, screen or uh, uh, slide decks part of it here. If we quick take a look and pull, if I can actually get over to my, sorry here. Um, I may end up having to, oh, come on. Okay, for some reason, I can't get my mouse over onto my other screen. This is you cool. Go the other direction. Oh, yes. Wow. Th thank you. It's been a very long day. Uh, so, yeah, let's go ahead and pull this over here. Come on. Okay. Come on, guys. There we go. So uh, latency wise, you can see it's it's not amazing. Uh, this this is actually going from my machine here to my uh, one at home. We're getting about 45 milliseconds once it settles down. But one thing we can do here is uh, if we just SSH, at uh, K8. Master, and this is uh, SSHing directly to my, my machine there at home, which is the head one. And oh, would help if I could type. Here we are connected, and obviously I need to run apt, but if we go sudo uh, and it should should work. And there you can see we've got a pod running. And the, the big part that uh, how I actually got this started, which is the, the somewhat interesting part. Uh, uh, so uh, first I just ran uh, cube control create nginx. Uh, and uh, to name it to nginx. And so I just stood it up that there is no uh, XML. And then to expose it out, I said, hey, expose uh, 
nginx port 80 uh, to anyone else inside of my my namespace and uh, the the only other part that it took to get it to up to run here was uh The, the ingress YAML, basically all I'm doing is just uh, saying that, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, if anyone uh, tries to hit any of the, uh, the servers uh, that, that are in my cluster here on port 80, just go ahead and route them directly through to Nginx. So if we hit that uh, 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 URL that, that uh, I was talking about in my slide deck here, which is that, uh, sorry here, uh, 7218881208. Uh, uh, and if you just hit that, you'll end up uh, sorry. Uh, Pull it up here, and uh, flannel is making the connection. And there you can see, and th this would be the point that you'd normally uh, add in files to your Nginx and do a whole bunch of other stuff. That is a whole other long discussion and presentation that uh, I neither had time uh, nor the willpower to uh, put together today. And plus since uh, we, we should probably be clearing out of here before about 8.30, before uh, the, the snow uh, makes it absolutely impossible to get home. Uh, uh, th that is a exercise for another day. But as you can see, uh, I, I know for a fact, I checked the pod is actually running at my home and we were able to connect to it from a uh, machine running in the cloud, uh, serving up uh, the basically making the uh, the uh, pass through to the the stuff uh, running behind my uh, under my uh, stairs there and uh, part of yes I say, it looks like that's a commercial project tail, tail scale you know pricing starts at free for one user but if you have more than one user you're talking five bucks a user a month uh, yes, so uh, uh, that that is correct. However, uh, really under the hood, it's using uh, WireGuard, and there's no reason that you can't make uh, WireGuard do all of this stuff. I just used it as a uh, I I have maybe two hours total invested in getting this cluster up and running, including installing Linux. So uh, it was a total just making life easier but you can totally do all of this with WireGuard uh, with a little less polish. Okay. So this is, yeah. uh, as, a, as a front end of WireGuard, is there anything similar to TailScale that is open source or free? Uh, Erkan, I, I think you were uh, trying to chime in. I, I'm not aware of anything that uh, has the, the same level of polish in the fact that it, they, they have basically servers out on the internet that help make uh, the, basically if you have two machines that are both behind uh, uh, NATs and all of the, those uh, nasty networking stuff that are the, the bane of existence, that they, there's, it, life becomes a lot harder but uh, for the, the use case where I have, where it's just a point to point connection, where one of them is a VPS out in the cloud, they, there's no reason you couldn't have used uh, uh, WireGuard. Also, TailScale does open source some of their stuff. So <laughs> you can go to GitHub TailScale and see, it looks like everything except the coordination server. The client's open source, the daemon's open source, the encrypted relay chat's open source. They just kept their coordination server closed, their, their magic sauce. I, when I set up my like WireGuard server, 
uh, it, I mean, my understanding was it was working in a like a server client model rather than like the distributed model uh, uh, the uh, Andrew was speaking about. So I think uh, I'm speculating that some of the tail scale code is making it more distributed or peer to peer connection rather than server clients kind of like a thing, I guess. Uh, in, in my case, uh, like all uh, uh, connected machines need to connect to the server and they will get an IP number in the range that the server is, uh, you know, uh, programmed to provide them. So they can communicate with each other after obtaining that IP, but they need to have a connection to the server to get that IP. Uh, that 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 was that is the extent of my understanding of how to use WireGuard. Yep, you, you're correct. Uh, basically, they provided some uh, special sauce that helps make all of those network connections happen. And uh, especially in my use case where I, I am a one user uh, space, uh, it, it just made sense. Uh, but that, that's one of those things for uh, a commercial project like that. I, I don't even wanna know what some of the other uh, VPN uh, uh, projects uh, like say uh, oh drawing but uh, Z scaler Z scaler that, that's the one I was trying to think of I I don't even want to know what they they charge uh, per user for their uh, magic but but your point is well taken Lee. And with that here, I will stop my share and also hit stop recording. Lost my mouse there just.